Hello and welcome. My name is Bill Marcotte and I'm the product manager for the Spartacus Storefront. I'm here to give an overview of the implementation of the B2B Commerce Organization feature available from SAP Commerce Cloud uh, through Spartacus. So a little bit about Spartacus. It's a JavaScript based storefront that is available exclusively for SAP Commerce Cloud. It forms part of the overall SAP Commerce Cloud uh, product that is um, licensed by SAP. Spartacus uh, JavaScript based is built using Angular. And what you do is you build an Angular app and you import the Spartacus libraries. And those libraries allow your app to access many of the function, much of the functionality that's available through SAP Commerce Cloud. It's also extendable and upgradable. And it comes with many uh, features um, that are supported by the backend. And one of these is what this course is about today, the B2B Commerce Organization feature. So the B2B Commerce Organization feature uh, is something that's available now for SAP Commerce Cloud. Uh, APIs were added to support this feature in the 2005 release, and B2B Accelerator templates have supported this for a few years now. The goal of this feature is to allow a buying organization the ability to track and control spending um, for purchases made by their buying employees. So an administrator might set up an organization that allows buyers to purchase, let's say, up to $100 worth of uh, equipment per month, uh, up to a maximum of $50 per order, for example. Uh, and this is all, all these contents will be explained during this course. One easy example is a hospital network might have a buying, a lead buying administrator who will set up an organization uh, that represents, uh, you know, nurses, doctors, orderlies, people that work at the hospital. And they have a, an account with a seller company that sells uniforms. And each of these people from the hospital network can log in and make purchases on the, uh, the seller's website. The spending is tracked and limited, and then an invoice uh, is sent back to the, uh, the hospital network through an arrangement between the seller and the, uh, and the buying organization, the hospital. So this requires, uh, let's say, a company that sells uh, products that uh, is using SAP Commerce Cloud, that is using B2B Commerce, and has set up B2B Commerce Organization. And, um, and what happens is the, let's say a, a lead buyer or buyer administrator requests an account and an agreement between the seller and the buyer for invoicing. And then the buyer administrator, uh, the administrator for the buying company can then set up their organization how they wish. And that screenshot you're seeing there is an example uh, of what you see if you're the administrator. And it's something I'll demo soon. Some of the terms you're gonna hear me say during the course, important to understand. Uh, units are considered the base, basic building block of, uh, of commerce organizations. So a unit can represent pretty much anything you want in your organization. It could be a store or a department or a group of people um, or a city or a country. Um, and uh, you just organize your unit hierarchy the way you want. So maybe you want to um, you know, develop um, an organization that starts off with a country and region, then cities, um, and then um, stores in those cities, and then departments, for example. You create users and assign them to all these units you're creating. Uh, some of the users represent buyers, some of them are administrators, some of them are approvers, people who approve purchases made by the buyers when they go over a certain limit. The, um, each unit is assigned at least one cost center, so this is simply used for tracking uh, spending and it's what the the buyer selects when they check out uh, Budgets are assigned to cost centers and this allows you to limit overall spending collectively by um, by having purchases uh, Count against a budget as purchases are made Buyers and improvers alike get assigned purchase limits which restricts how much a buyer can buy before the order is held uh, for approval and even approvers require limits so that they uh, are, so it's defined uh, how much they can approve before, let's say somebody higher up the hierarchy uh, is required to take a look. And finally, the way the out of the box B2B commerce organization works is that if you pay by account instead of by your own credit card, then you're required to ship the goods to a specific address as defined by the administrator uh, so that the purchase can be, uh, can be counted by the company and, and validated uh, before it gets to you. And finally, there's, um, there's a concept of user groups, which allows you to group users into a group so that you can assign uh, common spending limits. 
And I'm, I'm going to go over many of these topics again in later units in more detail. The types of users or the roles is also very important to understand. There are uh, buyers, administrators, approvers, and managers. Uh, buyers is officially named customers inside uh, B2B Commerce Organization, but to avoid confusion with the various usage, usages of the word customer, I'm going to call the person who makes purchases a buyer. Uh, there's an administrator who sets up everything, sets up the ads, the users, um, gives them the roles, defines the cost centers and budgets. Uh, there's an approver user who um, is assigned an order to approve if the buyer makes a purchase that goes over their limits or over the budget. And finally, there's a manager role included in SAP Commerce Organization uh, sample data, but it's not used uh, with the out of the box uh, setup. So this diagram, which you'll see uh, quite a bit of during this course, uh, represents, let's say, the relationship between all these different parts. You primarily have a unit, which might, which might have child units, uh, if you want. Um, units are assigned users, uh, and users have roles. So they're admins, or approvers, managers, or buyers. Buyers and approvers are assigned uh, spending limits, or they're part of a user group that has spending limits. So that's everything that's on the right side. Uh, your unit also is usually assigned an account manager, but that's not controlled by the buyer. It's usually the person that you talk to in order to set up the account. On the left side, you see that a unit is assigned at least one cost center, could be assigned more than one cost center, and then each cost center can be assigned more than one budget. Uh, and then when a purchase is made, it counts towards those budgets, and that could also limit or cause an approval to be required. And finally, you need those shipping addresses assigned to the unit. So when you select your cost center, it looks up the shipping addresses that you can use uh, when you are checking out. So I'm gonna demo very quickly the administrative part of, um, of B2B Power Tools, um, just as an introductory um, step right now, but in, the, in, the, in later units, I'll go into more detail. But it's important to note that when you install B2B Commerce Organization with SAP Commerce Cloud, it includes uh, sample data so that you don't have to build all these things from scratch. You have some sample users and sample companies to use. So this is uh, known as the rest of cardware people. And there's documentation on help.sap. You see the URLs at the bottom or you can just search for it that describe all these users and their roles so that you could log in uh, and uh, make purchases, pretend to be the administrator, pretend to be a prover, et cetera. Uh, so in this, uh, for these courses and, and pretty common users we use usually are Linda Wolf who's an administrator in Rusta Cardware. Uh, there's Mark Rivers, who's a buyer, and Carla Torres is, is one of the approvers, but not necessarily always the person who does the approval because depending on how much money Mark spends, it might have to go higher up the chain uh, depending on how it's configured. And uh, that's just an example of the power tool store that you're seeing there in that screenshot. So um, what I'm also gonna use to demo is, uh, is a public demo site that we have set up. Now it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit tricky to understand because if you go to the Power Tools demo site, uh, you'll be able to browse products, but you won't be able to log in unless you know Mark or Linda's login, which we don't make available because it's a very common login. Uh, so if you wanna fool around with our public demo site, feel free to contact me through our public Spartica Slack, which you can find through our documentation site, and I'll give you a login. Uh, but best if you're playing around with SAP Commerce Cloud and you have a license, is that you install Commerce Cloud and Spartacus locally and then play around with Power Tools yourself and you can just do anything you want. However, um, I'm gonna demo the demo site just for fun. So I'm gonna switch over to my Chrome now and um, you see um, this is the Power Tools page and the, uh, the demo site is called Spartacus, uh, Spartacus Demo East US Cloud and you can, um, you can find that link uh, from our documentation site. I've yet to sign in, uh, so I'm going to click sign in and I'm going to use Linda, famous Linda Wolf to sign in. And once I've signed in, uh, as Linda, I can add products to cart and try to check out. But because Linda, for example, is an administrator and not a buyer, she won't be allowed to. It's a permissions based restriction that she'll run into. Anyway, if you go under my account, you'll see my company. And then this gives you the range of different things that you can change. So units, users, cost centers, budgets, purchase limits, and user groups. And shipping addresses is actually part of units. And just a quick demonstration how I can go into, let's say, uh, Rustic Services. And then uh, I see that um, there are um, child units uh, as part of Rustic Services, which you saw in the hierarchy. And then there are some users maybe assigned to Rustic Services 
uh, these guys. And this is all the sample data that you see uh, in that documentation I was describing. So provers, shipping addresses, cost centers, et cetera. And really learning how to use commerce organization is really just about uh, what's the proper configuration needed for getting everything to work and also where to look for um, for how to configure or how the, how the, the different entities uh, relate to each other. And that's it for this unit, just a quick intro. Uh, I'll see you in the next unit, which will take you step by step through the B2B checkout journey. See you there. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is unit two of the B2B Commerce Organization Spartacus course. And this short unit is about describing the checkout journey that's seen by a buyer who's part of an organization, in this case, the famous Mark Rivers. So I, before I demo, I'll just point out some of the differences between, let's say, a standard or core or B2C checkout versus B2B. So B2C or core, our standard checkout, you're very familiar with it. It's the same as everywhere else. You specify a shipping address, um, a way to get your shipment to you, and then payment details, most of the time, <clears throat> most of the time credit card, or PayPal or Apple Pay. And then finally you review the details and you submit your order. Uh, in B2B, uh, the checkout journey is a little bit different because the uh, you still have the option to check out using credit card but uh, there's an option also to pay through your company account and if you choose to do so uh, then you're also required to specify a cost center and it links to a budget uh, automatically in the background and based on the cost center you choose uh, you end up being offered uh, a specific list of shipping addresses that are defined by your administrator so it's uh, it's you're limited to where you can ship your goods you can also specify a purchase order number. Otherwise, the rest of the process is the same, except of course, since you're paying by account, you don't have to specify a credit card anymore. Uh, like I said, you can always uh, choose to pay by credit card, but then the whole idea behind B2B commerce organization is that you don't have to submit an expense to your company afterwards, but it's, it's still possible for you to do so. So if you're trying this out for yourself, I recommend just using the um, the standard um, SAP Commerce Cloud backend installation using the CX recipe for the latest releases uh, with the Power, Stool, Power, Power Tool Store uh, enabled. And then uh, if you looked up the help documentation on Power Tool sample data, you'll see that one of the buyers you can choose is Mark Rivers. And uh, because SAP Commerce Cloud uh, doesn't ship with default uh, addresses, uh, sorry, default uh, passwords enabled, um, you, there is a little bit of setup there, and all this is described in the Spartacus documentation and links to the help documentation for SAP Commerce Cloud. That being said, like I mentioned, if you want to fool around with our demo site, you can contact me, uh, but I recommend doing a local setup instead because then you can pretty much do anything you want. All right, let's get to the demo. So I'm going to switch over to my, um, my browser, and uh, you can see that I'm pointing to uh, a local Spartacus uh, in the previous unit, I was pointing to our actual demo, but because I wanna make changes, uh, I'm gonna use my local installation. Uh, to start off, I'm gonna sign in as Mark Rivers. So he's a buyer for uh, one of the units uh, in, uh, in Linda Wolf's uh, Rustic Hardware organization. And if you remember from the previous unit, when I was Linda Wolf, uh, I had a My Company uh, item in the menu, but here I do not because Mark is simply a buyer he doesn't have the role of administrator or approver. An approver would say an approver menu item. So just like normal, uh, Mark can add something to the cart. And, uh, and the difference here is when he goes to checkout. So here we go, proceed to checkout. Um, if you're familiar with the B2C checkout, you notice a difference here. We don't start off with the shipping address, but you're able to enter a P purchase order number, a PO number, and you can choose to pay by credit card or account. Now, if you choose credit card, uh, and then you go through the process. Um, it's just like before, uh, shipping address, delivery mode, and your credit card details or payment details here. But of course, this is a B2B commerce organization course. We're gonna go with paying by account. And you see that the sections at the top change. So we have shipping address, delivery mode, payment details has disappeared. So I'm gonna go to the next step. Um, and this is probably the most important one. 
Uh, from this point, I can choose uh, a shipping address uh, down here, but the shipping addresses I can select depend on the choice of cost center. So Mark uh, only has access to one cost center uh, and that cost center only has one shipping address. So there, the options for Mark are limited, but in a second what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new cost center and a new shipping address and you'll see uh, see the differences. But so Mark has, um, uh, Mark has, well, has the selections done by default, so we hit continue. And then based on where the item is being shipped, there are some delivery options. And then finally you get to the review page and um, you review or you can go back. This is actually kind of new. You can go back and edit the purchase order uh, number or the uh, payment method and then step through it again. So I'm going to uh, submit this order. So I'm, I'm going to do another example where I add something to cart and I go to checkout. But um, what I'm going to do also is I'm going to go to a new window and I'm going to log in quickly as uh, Miss Linda Wolf. And, uh, and, it, and I'll be covering this in more detail, uh, how to set up your storefront. Uh, but just for the fun of it, uh, let's see what happens when we add uh, more cost centers. So here we go, my company. And we could see uh, going to users and Mark, I think, is on the next page. So next page here, Mark, 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 there we go. So you can see Mark uh, belongs to the custom retail unit over here. And if I click on custom retail and I go to cost centers, I see that uh, indeed the custom retail cost center that we saw when Mark went to check out is there. So I'm going to create another one called a test cost center. Uh, US dollars and the parent is custom retail that's where I am so I'm going to hit save and then um, I'm going to um, attach a budget that already exists to this cost center um, that way uh, that way mark can check out so there we go budgets there's no budgets attached I'm going to give it a big budget and that's done uh, another thing I said I wanted to do was add another address so addresses are owned by units and don't worry about memorizing all this stuff. Um, the, um, uh, the, um, the goal of this course is to teach you how to do all this. I'm just trying to provide an example. So if we go to custom retail, you'll see uh, under shipping addresses, there's one address. So I'm going to create another one. Uh, I'm in Canada. Uh, so test address, test address, test, test. Doesn't really matter what I write here for now and uh, hit save. Now, if I switch back to uh, to Mark's window, there we go. I'll just do a refresh to make sure all the data is there and I go to checkout. We can see that when I pay by account on the next page, now Mark has access to two uh, cost centers. And uh, because I've chosen custom retail, he has access to uh, these two addresses. Now, because test cost center is part of the same unit as a custom retail, the two addresses that Mark sees are the same because whether no, no matter whether I choose one cost center or another, they all belong to the same unit. But as you'll see in later units, um, the unit hierarchy is inherited. In other words, if I were to create child units of custom retail and then added cost centers and shipping addresses, etc. Uh, Mark would have access to those cost centers and then depending on the cost center chosen, the shipping address would, would change. So a, a real world example would be, uh, you know, Mark orders um, hardware parts for two different stores. And so uh, he chooses one cost center or the other, uh, depending on which store is getting the goods. And then the shipping address changes, but also the tracking of the purchase changes and the budget that it's, it's, it's counted against also changes. So um, finally, if we go to the order history, we'll see this one order that Mark created and it says pending. Uh, if the order, uh, remember uh, I said that B2B commerce organization uh, has an approval process and this is something I'll demonstrate in full later. But if the order required approval, then the status would have been pending approval and you would have seen a message at the bottom saying uh, the reason it needs approval and who's gonna approve it. But because this order is way below the purchase limits that Mark Rivers has, uh, which just take my word for it, is less than um, $951 plus tax or plus shipping, 
Um, this order was approved automatically and now it's going to go through the normal shipping process. And so that's why we see pending because uh, the way my SAP Commerce Cloud is set up, uh, the order is listed as pending while it's waiting for it to be pick packed and shipped. And once it does get uh, shipped, then somebody in the warehouse is going to click shipped and then the status will change to uh, en route. All right, so I'm going to switch back to uh, my PowerPoint uh, and go past the demo and just talk uh, for a couple of uh, more little, little tidbits about the B2B checkout. The only reason that Mark was able to check out is because the Commerce organization was set up properly. So for example, it means that uh, you know you had to create the unit hierarchy and you had to create Mark the buyer. Mark had to be assigned uh, spending limits. If Mark isn't assigned spending limits, then all of his purchases require approval, for example, which could be the case for your situation or, or your customer's situation. Uh, the unit has to have a cost center. The cost center has to have a budget. Uh, if any of those things are missing, uh, then you'll get, uh, then Mark will likely just get stuck along the way. For example, if there's no shipping address, then Mark won't be able to choose a shipping address and then he won't be able to continue. So uh, these couple of things uh, have to be uh, configured properly for Mark to at least check out. But of course, B2B Commerce organization is uh, has potential for many more complex situations. Finally, uh, I just wanted to use uh, this unit to uh, sort of demonstrate the sample data that's included with uh, SAP Commerce Cloud. Uh, so if you look on the right, uh, we have a, um, a set of units, Rustic being uh, the primary unit. So I'm actually gonna uh, switch back to my demo screen for a second to Linda. Uh, just to show that when I go to uh, units, you see that we have the Rustic unit as the primary or root unit, and then we have Rustic services, Rustic retail, and Rustic retail has custom retail. Uh, switch back to the PowerPoint. Uh, you'll see uh, we have Rustic as the primary unit or the root unit, Rustic retail, Rustic services as child units, and then custom retail is one of the child units of Rustic retail, and there's child units in other places. There's a shipping address, Bag B, and we created another one that's assigned to custom retail. Uh, there was a cost center called custom retail, um, confusingly enough, that was assigned to the custom retail unit and there was a budget assigned to the custom retail cost center. So when Mark Rivers, who's assigned as a buyer role to the custom retail unit made a purchase, he chose the custom retail cost center and his purchase was counted against the monthly 4K USD budget. If Mark needed approval for his order, Carla Torres would have been one of the first people uh, to, um, to take a look at it. Um, she may or may not have enough permissions to do the approval. If not, it would skip over to somebody else. Uh, Linda Wolf, ultimately the administrator, would get the ultimate approval if no one else can be found. But what are Mark Rivers permissions? Well, Mark has a permission assigned to him of 3000 per month. Uh, but also because of the way the sample data was set up, Mark is assigned to a user group called premium permissions, which has several people in that group. And that group has two different permissions, one of 25,000, and another one of 7,000 per order. So 25,000 per month, excuse me, and 7,000 per order. So that means, and when there's this conflict of two different, uh, two, two types of similar spending limits, then the, the more, uh, the freer or the bigger spending limit is, is used. So Mark can spend 25,000 per month, Mark can spend 7,000 per order, but Mark is also subject to a $4,000 uh, budget during that budget time period, which means if Mark spends more than $4,000, or if Mark spends more than $25,000 uh, in a month, uh, it'll be subject to approval. Uh, and um, all this is gonna be explained how to set this up in the following units. All right, that's the end of this unit. Uh, I'll see you in the next one where we talk about uh, creating units and modifying them. Hey everybody, it's Bill Marcotte speaking, the product manager for Spartacus, and this is unit three of the B2B Commerce Organization course, uh, units and shipping addresses. Units are the basic building block of a commerce organization. You create a unit hierarchy, a set of units that represents your organization uh, in any way you want. So in this very generic example, there's a primary root unit that has three child units, unit one, two, and three. And then each of those units, uh, second level units, has third level child units. Uh, so in my hospital example, 
Um, the primary unit might be the lead hospital network office. And then unit one, two, and three might be uh, the three hospitals in your network. And then the child units of the hospitals might be departments in the hospital or might be groups of people uh, depending on their, uh, their role, nurse, doctor, orderly. Uh, it could mean anything. So the primary unit could be a head office and the second level unit one, two, three could be uh, states or provinces and all the child units could be the store locations in, the, in those states or provinces. Or you could have another level where you have cities first and then you have the, the stores. And in the stores, you might have departments. So whatever makes sense for you, whatever is as, as complex or as simple as, as you wish, that meets uh, your needs. Uh, and remember, this is all done by the buyer. The sample data has actually two uh, sample stores set up. One of them is, uh, is Rust of Cardware. And this is what the example looks like. And this is documented in help.scp.com. Uh, there's a, a whole description of all the sample data that comes with SAP Commerce Cloud, so you can try it out. But uh, Rustic is, uh, is let's say, the root unit for uh, Rustic Hardware organization. And then there are two child units, Rustic Retail and Rustic Services. And then below those, Custom Retail, Services East and Services West. And the famous Mark Rivers that are used for the purchasing example in previous units, he's part of Custom Retail. Now, units own or associated with uh, several different things. Uh, the first obvious thing is that uh, a parent unit owns or um, harbors uh, child units or uh, subunits, and then those subunits could have more subunits. The, uh, the second most important thing is that units are, uh, own or assigned users, uh, and those users could have roles. So you might have a buyer user, an approver user, an administrator, um, all, uh, all belong to the same unit. And it's important which unit they belong to in, um, in regards to uh, the fact that uh, unit hierarchy permissions are inherited. So uh, as we'll talk in the next, uh, next uh, slide, uh, units have to be assigned at least one cost center. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. One cost center has to be assigned to a unit. A one cost center can't be assigned to uh, more than one unit but a unit could have multiple cost centers, which is pretty typical in, in organizations. Uh, shipping addresses are owned by units as well. They're actually not listed anywhere else. And these are the locations that uh, you can ship goods to if you pay by account and you choose the cost center for this unit. So the shipping addresses displayed to the buyer during checkout depend on the, uh, the cost center chosen. Um, and remember cost center, there's only one cost center, sorry, a single cost center is assigned to a single unit. So um, the cost center selection is, is unique. And then finally, and um, this is an important um, topic that we'll bring back a couple times during this course. Um, you have people who are given the role of approver and then you have approvers assigned to units. And what this means is you could have the role of approver, but maybe you're not the approver for the unit. You have to be assigned to be the approver for the unit. It's two distinct things. And it's actually meant to be flexible in that regard. So you could create, let's say, a complex hierarchy, but you could add all the approver users to the root unit. Uh, and then you might have, let's say, a second row of child units and you would assign each of these people as approvers to each unit. So that uh, unit one has approver one, unit two has approver two, unit three has approver three. But all the approvers are defined in the root level. That's just one way to do it. Uh, and it's an important distinction to understand. And that's why uh, when we go to look at um, the demo of, of this feature, you'll see that approvers are listed separately besides just the roles. All right, speaking of demos, let's get to it. So I'm gonna switch over to my, uh, my browser, which is already logged into uh, as, as Linda. Uh, so I'll start from here, just, uh, so I have units, users, cost centers. So I'm gonna start with units. And you can see that this, uh, this first list is sort of like a tree listing of the units available uh, in my uh, Power Tool store. And this represents the sample data because this is the out-of-the-box sample data unchanged except for the cost center added in a previous unit. 
So I can see that um, Rustic is divided into two areas. There's a services department, I guess you could say, and there's a, uh, a retail. And, uh, and retail has one, sub ch one child for custom retail. So there, I guess there's a standard retail and the custom retail. And then Rustic Services is divided into two regions, West and each, uh, East, and they're all active. Now I'm gonna focus on custom retail because that was the one that Mark Rivers belongs to. Once I click on custom retail and notice this is a really, really smooth interface, much, much improved from Accelerator. Um, you can display the unit details, so the name, the ID, the status, and what the parent unit is, and you can click to go back to that if you want. Um, you can edit that information, uh, which I won't do right now. You can disable the unit altogether, which actually is a unit unto itself. Uh, be careful when disabling, you'll get a, um, a warning message, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's actually pretty uh, it's pretty dangerous, so uh, it disables everything that's below the unit. So we'll talk about that in another unit. But the important thing I wanted to point out was here are the child units for this unit. There's none. Uh, here are the users assigned to this unit. Uh, we see that Anthony uh, is a customer. Axel is a customer. Carla is an approver uh, role, but maybe not the approver. Uh, and Mark is, is, a, is a buyer, is a customer. Uh, if I click on approvers, this is actually the list of people who are legitimate approvers, assigned to be approvers for this unit. So if Carla wasn't listed here, yet Carla is listed here as an approver, uh, Carla wouldn't be the approver. To be an approver for this unit, for people who make purchases on this unit, Carla has to be added to this list. And when you create users, you're automatically asked if you want to assign the user. Uh, shipping addresses. Uh, so this is, you see the second address that I added in a previous demo. Uh, so this is the list of places people can ship to uh, when they choose uh, one of these cost centers. So, um, so that's it for the, uh, for the overview of units. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint, but we'll come back later to create a unit. Um, now it's it's important to know that if you're starting from scratch uh, you're usually if you're that person they buy your administrator uh, you usually make an arrangement with uh, the seller uh, to let's say you know agree that uh, many people can make purchases and then all the invoices will be sent to your company for payment um, it's not as simple as just registering and logging in uh, there has to be some kind of arrangement um, the uh, the seller would also create your unit for you and give it to you and then as the administrator you would set up all the units and the cost centers yourself uh, the important thing though is that um, let's say in the sample data Linda um, she uh, she inherits or she has access to anything that's below so Linda being the administrator for primary unit the root unit uh, can make changes to all the units that are below primary unit uh, yet if Linda makes another administrator um, and assigns that person as administrator for unit one, then that person will only be able to see unit one and the child units below that and make changes there. So administrator two, who is administrator of unit one, will not be able to see or modify unit two or three. Uh, so permissions are inherited. And this also has implications for the cost centers and shipping addresses uh, that are available when you're checking out. Uh, if Mark is assigned to unit one and there's a cost center and shipping address there and then there are other cost centers and shipping addresses in subunits or child units then mark will also have access to those cost centers and those shipping addresses uh, which makes sense because like you know maybe mark is a buyer for a store that has many departments and so he wants to choose the cost center for a specific child unit or department uh, which may have different uh, delivery addresses different different uh, warehouses uh, nearby and maybe in the at the store or maybe at another location that's associated with the store All right, let's demo creating unit. It's going to be pretty simple uh, So I'm going to start from the beginning here. I have all my units. I'm going to click add uh, I'm going to give my unit a name. My name is Bill Bill unit Bill unit uh, Approval process. There's only one option in the sample data uh, but this is the approval process on the merchant side. So really you only have the choice of what the merchant set up and the out-of-the-box sample data has this escalation approval with merchant check. Uh, that means that uh, when the order goes through and is approved by your guys uh, or women, um, your, um, the merchant could also do a check or approval depending on if the order is really big. Um, and then finally, 
who's going to be the parent of this unit. So I'm going to choose custom retail just for fun. And then we see that now custom retail has a child unit. And if I click on custom retail and go to child units, you see that bill unit is there. Now, a few issues with this unit already is that um, without, um, without uh, users, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you, uh, Mark Rivers is a, um, uh, a buyer that, that's in a unit above this one. So he'll be able to see this, uh, this unit. However, um, there's no shipping address and there's no cost center and that cost center would have to have a budget. So uh, this unit's pretty useless without those things, but we'll talk about that in, in, other, um, in other units of this course. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. All right. Um, okay, I guess I've started enough, but uh, just one more time. Uh, when a buyer goes to checkout uh, and they choose a cost center, the shipping addresses that he sees depends on the shipping addresses that are associated with the unit that the cost center is assigned to. And this is what we're gonna demo in a second is creating a shipping address. Uh, but this is important because that means when you pay by account, you're restricted in where you can ship the goods that you're buying. Um, and so the selection of the cost center there becomes really important. And if there are different locations uh, for it to be sent to with the same cost center, then all the shipping addresses would belong to the same unit. But if there are multiple cost centers and multiple units with multiple different shipping addresses, then you would create multiple units and add those shipping addresses uh, to those units. So you can restrict uh, which shipping addresses are used uh, based on the cost center chosen. So I'm going to quickly demo that, switching to my uh, my Chrome. So um, addresses actually don't have their own box here; they're their own uh, by by unit. So I'm going to go to Bill's unit. I'm going to click on shipping address. You see that there are none. Uh, so here I'm going to click create, and uh, I'll create my uh, my shipping addresses. Bill Smith, one two three Main, no second address phone number, city, zip, and then state or province. So there we go, save. So, so far so good. Um, when somebody uh, who's assigned to this unit, and there is nobody right now, um, chooses a cost center, of which there is none, then at least there's a shipping address for them to use uh, when, they go to, uh, when they go to check out. All right, so, um, couple more things about um, um, shipping addresses and units uh, and this is not covered by or not in scope by this course but it's worth mentioning um, the it's been mentioned already that or I mentioned already that B2B conference organization is self-service so the seller provides the commerce organization functionality that the buyer administrator can then use to set up their hierarchy set up accounts set up cost centers for tracking spending uh, give permissions for people to make purchases, set up approvers, et cetera. But the seller also has the opportunity to sort of take advantage of the fact that this organization, this buyer organization exists. So for example, um, and these are advanced topics, you can link customer catalogs, custom catalogs to customers based on their organization. So you can offer special products or special prices because the buyer uh, officially belongs to Rustic Hardware, for example. Uh, you can take a look at uh, purchases being made uh, based on organization and uh, and get insight into what customers are interested in. And finally, there's another feature of SAP Commerce Cloud called Sales Organization, which you can look up on help.sap.com, that, um, that allows you to uh, connect uh, your seller organization, your sales organization, or your support organization to um, the B2B Commerce Organization. So that uh, when, I, uh, let's say, a request comes in or an email, uh, you can send it to the right person or uh, a future feature to be supported by Spartacus Commerce Quotes, which is actually already supported by B2B Accelerator. Uh, the, the quote request can go directly to a specific person based on a link between uh, the seller group that you've created, the sales organization you've created, uh, linking that to the buyer organization uh, that the buyer created. Okay, so that's it on uh, everything you need to know about units and shipping addresses. Uh, and I'll see you in the next unit. Hey everybody, welcome to unit four of the B2B Commerce Organization course. 
uh, users and roles. So a user belongs to a unit. Uh, a user can only belong to one unit. But as we'll see and as been mentioned, um, a user has access to or inherits permissions for any child units of the unit that they belong to. Power Tool Sample Store, uh, which is the out-of-the-box configuration of the B2B Commerce Organization feature, includes four roles. Uh, the customer or the buyer, as I like to call it, the administrator, um, the approver, and then uh, the manager. A manager is not used. Uh, the buyer is obvious. It's the person who makes the purchases. Uh, the administrator is the person who does all the setup. And depending on where they are and where they're assigned in the unit hierarchy, they may not have access to all the units, just maybe their own, uh, their own portion. And then uh, there's an approver role, uh, which is uh, the person who does approvals of orders that go beyond spending limits. But uh, there's also, uh, to uh, make sure there's a distinction, there's the role of approver, and then there's a person assigned to do approval uh, task for a unit. Uh, and we'll, um, we'll see that in this, uh, I'll demonstrate that in this unit. So uh, the role and the placement in the unit hierarchy is important. So Linda Wolf in the sample data is administrator uh, who's assigned to the root unit and Linda has access uh, and can change anything under the root unit, so essentially everything. Uh, whereas um, if a buyer was assigned to the rustic root unit, then they would be able to see, uh, maybe they can administer, but they would be able to see all the cost centers uh, and select all the cost centers uh, that, you could, uh, that you could access uh, based on the hierarchy, the, the uh, inheritance of permissions. However, in the out-of-the-box sample data, Mark Rivers, who's my example in this course, only has access to one cost center and one shipping address because uh, that's the way it's set up uh, for his custom retail unit. Now, I'm just going to switch over to my, um, to my browser to do a quick demo. Um, what I've done is, um, actually, I have to switch over to here. Uh, what I've done is if uh, I've added a... Um, um, a child unit to custom retail. So if I go to organization and then units, and then rustic retail and then custom retail, you'll see I've added a new child unit called bill unit. And this bill unit has, uh, well, has no child units, but it has a shipping, its own shipping address in Alberta and its own cost center, uh, subunit CC, which is different from um, the two units, uh, sorry, the two cost centers that are available in custom retail. So here's two cost centers that I created in previous, um, previous uh, for previous demonstration purposes for previous units of this course with their own uh, shipping addresses, bag B and test test. So I'm just gonna switch to uh, Mark Rivers checkout. I'm gonna refresh to make sure it's all there. Just to show that, um, that Mark, uh, even though, whoop, I, I should switch back just for a second. Even though Mark um, in uh, in the uh, in the bill unit, if you look at the users of bill unit, this list is empty. Uh, Mark is assigned to the parent unit of bill unit, so custom retail users. There's uh, there's Mark. So this is just to show that uh, show the inheritance. So I go back to checkout, and you see that by default it's choosing custom retail, but I have the choice of using the custom retail test cost center and the addresses don't change because the custom retail and custom retail test CC are both, uh, they both belong to the custom retail unit. However, the subunit cost center belongs to the subunit that I created. And when I select this, I get a different address. Here's the address in Alberta because I chose the cost center. And the reason Mark can access this is because the unit that has this cost center is a child unit of what Mark belongs to. and. Uh, and permissions are inherited. So that was just to show, uh, show that. So I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint. Uh, okay, well, actually back to demoing. <laughs> um, we're gonna be creating a user and assigning a password. So this is aimed at uh, administrators. So I'm gonna go to the administration window I have. Uh, so let's say you're uh, creating a new user. There are actually two steps. Um, so I'm going to the list of all users uh title the usual stuff uh, bill smith 
uh, billsmith at sap.com for his email. And then I have to choose what role we want. Uh, so I'm gonna choose customer to start and, um, and then choose the unit. So I'll, I'll use bill unit. So this guy is gonna be a buyer. So I'll click save. And then if I go to organization units, bill unit, uh, I should see uh, Bill Smith show up there. That's great. Um, so another way to create users is to do it from the units listing. But in this case, you're saying, oh, I want this person assigned to this unit. So you can't change it here. And you see that it's, it's hard coded kind of. So I'm going to create an approver called, uh, you know, uh, app rover, uh, app rover at sap.com. And I'm going to make him an approver. And this is where I wanted to point out the distinction um, between a role of approver and assignment of approver. So I'm going to click approver and then you have the choice to add this user to the approvers of this unit. You may or may not want to do that depending on how you're setting up your organization. So I'm going to check this box and what I expect is that the user gets created and also when I click on the approvers list I should see the person's name show up there as well. Um, so I'm going to click save. Uh, and just for comparison's sake, uh, I'm going to create another user. Uh, whoop, did it save? Whoop. Weird messages. Uh, I'm going to create another user <coughs> uh, called app rover2, rover2 at sap.com. Uh, and I'm going to click approver. Uh, let's call them at uh, not assigned uh, just to. Uh, just to distinguish, not assigned approver. And then I won't click this checkbox and save. Uh, oh, approver to save. There we go. Okay. So um, now if I go to units, uh, bill units, I'm expecting to see, well, first of all, I have three users, uh, the approver user, Bill Smith, and then the approver who is not assigned. And then when I click on the approvers link, I should see only approver, not the other approver, uh, approver that was created. Again, just to be clear, you can create users that have the role of approver, but they don't necessarily are assigned the approval duties for a particular unit or user. That has to be done separately, or you check that box and it's done automatically. And also don't forget when you're setting up approvers, um, you can actually assign uh, approvers directly uh, to a user. So in this case, um, Anthony Lombardi doesn't have an approver, but you see that some of these people could be made approvers. All right. The last thing I'll talk about with uh, users, and then I'll move on, is uh, is that they don't automatically get an email address. So if I go to the, my app rover uh, and this person tries to log in, they won't be able to. Um, so you'd have to click change password just to enter uh, a password. Whoop, those passwords don't correspond to our, our minimums. Whoop. One more try. There we go. Okay, so our minimum password is a capital letter, a symbol, and a number. So safe. Now this person can, uh, can log in. I'll have to tell them their password. All right, back to the PowerPoint. So we've created a user and we've assigned a password. Uh, one thing I should do too, just to demonstrate, I'm going to switch back. What happens if you want a user, uh, you want to you want to change a user's unit? Uh, that's easy enough to do. I'm going to go to the approver not assigned, and I'm going to click edit, and from here I can change the unit that they belong to. So I'm going to move Mr. App not assigned approver all the way up to Rustic. There, and then if I go to organization units Rustic, I should see. Uh, Mr. Non-Assigned Approver um, in the list, then I do. All right, back to PowerPoint. Here we go. Um, so I already mentioned, talked about this, but let's say it one more time just to be sure. Um, Carla is a, uh, is, is a person who has the role of approver and Carla is assigned uh, the duty or, or the task of approving to custom retail. So you can create uh, Carla as a single user with the role approver and put her anywhere you want. But then you can assign Carla to be the approver for individual people and for individual units. And also Carla will inherit permission to approve for any of the units that are child units. So it's pretty flexible and powerful. Uh, it just, when, when people are playing with uh, 
commerce organization for the first time, sometimes uh, it's uh, it's there's some uncertainty as to why a particular approver uh, doesn't um, doesn't get the approval rights. It goes to somebody else, and we have a whole unit dedicated to approving. So I'll go into more detail uh, about troubleshooting that. Uh, but just remember, um, role of approver and uh, assigned approver are, are two different things. All right. Uh, buyers and approvers, uh, I mentioned that already. Um, and um, um, one thing to mention here about the hierarchy too is that if somebody makes a uh, purchase as the guy in custom retail, for example, and there's an approver assigned to custom retail, but they don't have the right permissions to approve it, uh, approve the order, then it goes up one, uh, one level. It, goes, it looks for other approvers that are assigned to the same unit and it goes up to uh, higher up to approvers who are in uh, units higher up. And then finally, it goes up like that, looking for somebody who's an appropriate approver. And if no one is found, um, then the, uh, the administrator is chosen. All right, oh, I've already created an approver, so we don't have to do that. Uh, and that's the end of the um, unit. I'll see you in the next unit, thank you. Hey everybody, welcome back to the B2B Commerce Organization course. Uh, this is Unit 5, Cost Centers and Budgets. So cost centers and budgets go hand in hand because uh, you create a cost center for tracking spending and assign it to a unit. And the person who is assigned to that unit as a buyer uh, or uh, let's say has access to the child units uh, because of the inheritance of uh, units um, chooses a cost center during checkout, but then the budget that's assigned to that cost center uh, is used to limit spending. So uh, orders, uh, order totals accumulate against a particular budget when cost centers are selected. And then uh, it's good for tracking and budgetary purposes. Budgets are created uh, with a specific period of time in mind, whereas cost centers are essentially just a number. Um, but also um, a budget can, can limit spending in that it can trigger approval if uh, a particular order causes uh, a budget overrun. So for example, if you have a budget of $1,000 in one week and, uh, and 10 people spend $1,000, uh, sorry, 10 people spend $100, the, uh, the 11th order that started with that same cost center combination with budget uh, will be triggered for approval because now we've blown the budget, I guess you could say. <clears throat> so uh, in its simplest form, you create a unit, assign a buyer to that unit, you create a cost center, assign it to that unit, and then you create a budget, uh, which is assigned to that cost center. And what you're seeing in front of you in that diagram is how the sample data is set up, the power to sample data in the out of the box SAP Commerce Cloud um, sample data power tool store. Um, so um, some of the budgets you'll see when playing around with the Power Tools store, uh, you'll see like a $4,000 budget assigned to custom retail. You'll see maybe a $2.5,000, uh, sorry, $2,500 budget assigned to Services East and a $20,000 uh, budget uh, to Services West. And you'll see that some of them are, uh, are weekly, some of them are, are, are monthly, um, etc. Um, just to clarify that uh, cost center can only be assigned to one unit, but you can create multiple cost centers and assign them to units. So let's say a buyer who is assigned to a unit that has only one cost center, only has that choice of that one, but a buyer who has two cost centers assigned to their unit, there might be two different reasons to uh, choose a cost one cost center over another. Uh, for example, there might be a cost center for consumables like paper or laser toner, and another cost center for uh, clothing, for example. Um, but the opposite is for budgets. Uh, a single budget uh, can be added to uh, many cost centers. And this is uh, because of the, the different nature of the two things. So cost centers are for tracking, budgets are for limiting. So you might create a cost center for clothing, a cost center for consumables, and a cost center for, um, I don't know, um, lunchtime snacks. 
but then uh, you want the uh, you want all those costs to be to accumulate against a single budget uh, as expressed with that with the diagram in front of us there. Okay, let's get to a demo. Switching over to uh, to my browser uh, where I'm logged in as uh, Linda Wolf. There we go. My mouse is back. Um, so um, so I'm gonna go look first of all at uh, at the cost centers that are assigned to custom retail. Uh, here we go, we see custom retail, that's the original sample data and custom retail test CC was the one I created. And if I wanna see uh, the budgets that are assigned to that cost center, I can go directly to the cost center. Uh, here's custom retail, click on budgets and I see monthly 4,000 USD. Um, and if I want to assign or unassign different budgets to the cost center, I can click manage and it shows me all the budgets that are available to assign uh, to this, uh, this cost center. So if, for example, I wanted to change it and I want this weekly one, I click assign and then done. And then you see that now we have the monthly and the weekly. Um, for the budgets, uh, just to show what exactly is, is being created in a budget. Uh, for example, the monthly, the reason why it's called a a, um, uh, a monthly 2005 uh, budget is that um, well it's just how it was named when it was uh, when it was created that uh, you would create a budget for example that um, uh, reflected how uh, you might let's say for for all of January have a budget of two thousand five hundred dollars but for the purposes of our sample data we have a start and end date that are huge uh, so that way the budget's still in effect when people install the sample data but the idea behind this budget is that you create something that limits the spending for 30 days, let's say. Uh, and for this one, this would have been a budget for uh, for a week, for example. And we'll see uh, when we uh, when we create them. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to create a cost center. Um, so by doing it from the cost centers list, I can assign it to any unit. So I'm going to I'm going to call it uh, cost center uh, unit. Um, unit five, and I'll use the same code. And uh, the really only, the only other other real option is the currency used. There's really nothing to the cost center besides it being used for tracking purposes. So I'll put it under the um, uh, under the bill unit that I created, the new one. I'll click save, and that's pretty much it for cost centers. And um, if I wanted to change the ownership of the cost center. Uh, you would go to the list of cost centers, click on the unit, and then click edit, and then you can change uh, the unit here. Uh, but remember, uh, one cost center can only be assigned to one unit. Right now, there are no budgets. Um, if I click manage here, uh, I can I could assign a budget, but what I want to do is create a new budget first. So I'm going to go back to organization, uh, budgets, and click add. Uh, so I'm going to create um, let's say call it a budget unit five. And this one is gonna be a monthly budget for April. So it's March right now. So I'm gonna say April 1st to uh, April 30th. Uh, maybe I should change it to monthly. Here we go, month. Uh, the currency is US dollar. And this, so the amounts, so this is important. Um, what I'm saying here is that for the month of April, whoever uses the cost center that's linked to this budget uh, can only spend in total $2,000. So not, sorry, not one person, but uh, for all the people that use the cost center that's gonna be linked to this budget, they can only spend up to $2,000. And it could be multiple cost centers. So I'm gonna assign this to the bill unit as well and click save. Uh, and finally, it's just important uh, that to note that this budget hasn't been assigned to anything yet. So I'm going to go um, uh, to the to the cost center I created. So that was CC Unit Five, uh, and I'm going to add uh, the new budget that I assigned to it. So now what this means is uh, is if I go to uh, Mark, um, who's in a separate browser window here, let's see, and I refresh then um, when I, I click on the list of cost centers available, I now see the new unit, um, the new cost center I just created, unit five. And this purchase is gonna be made uh, against uh, a different budget this time. It's gonna go against um, the budget, budget unit five month, which is $2,000 for April. 
And, um, and if, let's say, for example, the only, let's say there were no budgets, uh, when I go to check out, it wouldn't work. And also if the budget has expired and you go to check out, it still wouldn't work. So the, um, there's checks and balances. You can't check out unless you have an active budget or an active cost center. And if any of those things don't work uh, or are inactive or just, you know, like the, the budget uh, is outside of its month or its time period, then, um, then you're not allowed to check out. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, you're not it's it's to uh, it's to track uh, restrict and to uh, to limit spending so in that case you would call up your administrator and, and mention that there's this problem and then uh, they would fix the problem by going into uh, b2b commerce organization and correcting it themselves all right uh, that really is it for the um, for the cost center and budgets uh, there's a few uh, interesting points that uh, come after the slide uh, a reminder that um, uh, that the cost center is super important because during checkout they select the cost center and that sort of starts the whole ball rolling. I, I just demonstrated that, but it's really important to point this out that there's a uh, there's a direct connection here between how a person checks out using B two B B two B commerce organization uh, and uh, a hidden thing uh, or something that let's say the uh, the buyer isn't aware of right there is that the custom retail has a particular budget behind it. Um, the, uh, it bears repeating as well that um, the cost center uh, that a buyer can select um, depends on the unit uh, that they belong to or the unit that they have access to. So in this example, we have rustic retail and custom retail and Mark belongs to custom retail. So that means he has access to all the cost centers that are part of custom retail. Uh, but if there were other units, as demonstrated in my examples, uh, he would have access to those cost centers as well. Uh, and it's just not immediately obvious, that's why I'm, I'm mentioning it. And finally, the shipping address uh, that that uh, Mark uh, can, can ship to uh, is locked, right? It, it's defined by the administrator and depends on, the, again, the cost centers and the units um, that are chosen. And this example, uh, it just reiterates the uh, the idea that once you choose a cost center, um, the budget that's assigned to that cost center is the one that's used for um, for limiting overall spending for the group of people. So those are the things that are affected or, or associated with cost centers and budgets, but it's important to mention a few of the things that aren't associated with it. For example, purchase limits are not related to the cost center. Uh, purchase limits are assigned to users directly or they're assigned to user groups. So uh, depending on how you've configured your organization or if you're using the sample data that comes with Power Tools, um, the, the purchase limit that's applied to a particular user or a particular buyer uh, will either be part of their own, um, uh, their own user definition or it'll be part of the user group definition that they belong to, but nothing to do with the cost center or the budgets. Um, it's two different, uh, two different ways of limiting spending. You can tell you can define that a particular person can only spend a particular amount per order per month, or you can define that a group of people who have access to a cost center or multiple cost centers can only spend in total and aggregate a certain amount of budget before that budget is, uh, is, is has gone past its limit as well. So two, two different ways to approach the, um, the challenge of, let's say, controlling and limiting spending. The decision as to who approves the order um, is also not limited to, uh, sorry, is also not uh, associated with the cost center or uh, budget. Uh, as we saw in, uh, mentioned in previous units and as will be more thoroughly explained in a future unit, the approver is either assigned directly to a unit or directly to a user. And if uh, that approver doesn't have the right approval permissions, let's say, um, then it goes up the chain uh, to somebody else who's higher up in the unit hierarchy to the point where if they run out of approvers, then the, um, the last administrator standing is the person who would do the approvals. Especially if, for example, you might have an approver who can approve small orders, uh, but then if it goes over budget, then the administrator is the only person that's allowed, allowed to approve that order. Um, and finally, um, because you're linking orders with cost centers and budgets, uh, that data is now in the back end uh, and it's easily extracted for 
um, for reporting. It's not an out of the box feature, but because the data is there, it's uh, it's quite easy to get it out. Uh, and then you can uh, you can also because of the the time limits that are available for budgets, you can limit spending uh, during specific time periods. Um, so let's say you would allow more spending, um, you know, in 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 the, in the springtime for some reason, but then in the in the in the fall or Christmas, you limit it so that people aren't just you know spending the company's money willy nilly, which of course most everybody tries not to do that. But uh, that's what uh, that's what checks and balances are for. All right, so that's the end of this new unit. Um, see you in the next unit. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Bill Marcotte. I'm the product manager for Spartacus and I'm here with unit six of the BDB Commerce Organization course, purchase limits and approval process. Purchase limits are used to define when an order placed by a buyer in your organization, uh, whether the order is approved automatically because it's below certain limits or whether it requires approval by another person who's, who's defined as the approver for that person or for the unit. Um, normally a buyer will have both order and per month limits or per time span limits, let's say. So if let's say the order limit was $100 and the per month limit was $500, uh, an order would be approved automatically. And if it was above that, uh, it's held, the order is held for human approver again in the buying organization and nothing to do with the seller uh, to go in and check the order and uh, click approve before the order continues to the workflow. It's important to note that the order is actually placed. So it's not like a cart or a, um, in a status of waiting to be placed in the um, uh, in SAP Commerce Cloud. Uh, it's an actual order, but that is being held in the workflow until the approval uh, is given. And all orders go through this workflow. So even if something's automatically approved, it still goes through this workflow and then it's been given, it's given the, um, the approved um, status. Uh, there's a third approval uh, type called budget exceeded, and this is when uh, orders that are counting against a budget, if you recall from the cost centers and budget unit, uh, whenever you go to make a purchase, you have to uh, select a cost center and there are budgets associated with that cost center. So if the cumulative order totals for all the orders against a single budget uh, go over the budget, so there's a budget overrun, then the order is also held even if the other uh, restrictions are good. Uh, so for example, if you have a 10 people who spend $100 uh, each and the budget is $1,000, then somebody who spends even $5 uh, causes the budget to go over and that order is held until someone who has permissions to approve budget overruns um, approves the order. So uh, in summary, there are three types of purchase limits. Uh, there's per order, so a single order placed has a limit. There's per time span, uh, which can be per day, week, month, quarter, or year. And then there is the uh, the budget exceeded. And any of these could flag an order for approval. And what you'll see when we look at um, an order that's been flagged for approval, it could be for one or more reasons. Like um, something might be within the order limit, but not within the time span limit and might be budget exceeded. So those are the two reasons something's blocked or it could be only the budget exceeded that's blocked. And this is described in the order details when something is, is blocked from processing, blocked for approval. So you can assign purchase limits directly to a buyer or to save some time and to keep things more organized, you can assign buyers to user groups and assign a purchase to a user group. And this is actually done both ways in the sample data that comes out of the box with SAP Commerce Cloud. Um, purchase limits also apply to approvers, uh, not because approvers make purchases, but because approvers do approvals. And so let's say a buyer might have a limit of spending $100 per order, uh, $500 per month, uh, but an approver might have a limit of being able to approve orders that are up to $5,000 per order and $10,000 per month. And if those limits are exceeded, then the selected approver or the approver that usually might do an approval is skipped over in favor of someone who has more permissions to do the approval. And, and it goes, what happens is when an order requires approval, the, the workflow looks up the chain to see which approver 
what is the first approver or who is the first approver that can approve this order based on all the different configuration settings. And finally, if no approver is found, then the, uh, the, the, the top level administrator is given the task of, of approving. An approver could also have, uh, and a buyer can also have a, um, a budget exceeded approval, meaning that uh, let's say an approver normally approves per order or per month limits, uh, but when they go over budget, this might be something set by someone higher in the administrative chain. So an approver might not necessarily have budget exceeded uh, permission. In other words, when uh, let's say 10 people order 10 orders that go over budget, uh, the 11th order gets, gets blocked. And because let's say another person might be in charge of the budget, they might have the ultimate uh, decision-making power for allowing an order to continue, even though the budget has been uh, blown, right, overrun. Uh, so this is a setting you can add, you can give approval to an approver, uh, sorry, you can give budget exceeded to an approver or not, depending on how you want to set up your, um, uh, your commerce organization. So here's one example, or actually here's a few examples. So you say you have, um, bill buyer who's got a per order limit of $500 and a per month limit of $1,500. And, and the approver has a per order and per month limit of $10,000 and $30,000 respectively, but and does not have the budget exceeded permission. So uh, given that no orders have been placed yet, uh, if bill places a $100 order, uh, it's automatically approved. If bill uh, pay, uh, makes a $5,000 order, um, that goes over the per order limit and also goes over the per month limit. Uh, so that means uh, Anne can review it. Uh, but if, um, uh, if an order is placed that's $20,000, uh, that exceeds the per order limit that Anne has. So that means Anne will be skipped over for review. And if the order goes over budget because many people have making purchases and the cumulative budget has been surpassed, then also Anne cannot review, even if the order is within budget uh, uh, purchase limits because Anne just doesn't have that permission to do so. All right, so I'm gonna to switch to a demo. Uh, I'm gonna to go to um, my famous Mark Rivers. Um, the, um, the idea is that, um, uh, is that Mark has certain uh, per order and per month um, spending settings. And if I were to spend more than that amount of money, uh, then my order will be flagged for approval and won't uh, continue. So I'm actually gonna uh, not look at Mark yet. I'm actually going to switch to my uh, my my company, my my commerce organization login I have here uh, with Linda Wolf, who's in charge of Mark and many others. And if I uh, I want to know what Mark's limits are, I have to look in two places. So I go to Mark first of all in the users list, and I see under um, purchase limits that Mark has a three thousand dollar per month purchase limit. Uh, this is the name of the purchase limit. Uh, it, of course, the um, the actual numbers could be different. So let's let's go to the purchase limit and see if really the three thousand dollar per month purchase limit. Yes, there it is, three thousand dollars per month. Okay, um, and I just want to go back here just to show uh, Mark's initial approver is actually. Uh, whoop, no, it's not assigned directly to Mark. Let me go back for a second. Uh, so remember, approvers can be assigned to people or to units. So what I really want to do is look for Mark's unit and then look for the approvers. And I see that Carla uh, is the initial approver for Mark for custom retail. Anybody in custom retail making purchases, they will if, if an order needs approval, they will first look at Carla. Um, however, and something that um, I have a troubleshooting section at the end of this course, because sometimes it can get confusing about why something, uh, why uh, an order is flagged or not. Uh, or why Carla is the approver or not. Um, so the other thing to look for when you're uh, when you're working with commerce organization and approvals is that Mark uh, or your user might also belong to a user group, and indeed Mark does belong to a user group, premium permissions. And premium permissions, remember user groups can be assigned their own purchase limit. So if I look at user group and see premium permissions, I see that there are purchase limits um, I just have to refresh here, okay. I see that purchase limits are assigned to this as well. So Mark belongs to um, to premium permissions and he had the 3,000 per month uh, order limit, but he also has a 25,000 per month order limit here. So there's kind of a conflict, two, two same types of, of, uh, of limits for the same person. So 
uh, in this case, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the system, the workflow system will take the more permissive permission. So um, following it logically, then Mark can spend $25,000 per month because he's part of this user group. But he also has a limit of $7,000 per order. Uh, so all that to say, what we expect is, um, so given that there are two per month limits, one of 3,000, one 25,000, that means um, if Mark spends more than 25,000, the more permissive number per month, uh, the order will get flagged. So if Mark spends $24,999 and then spends $2, the order will be flagged because he's gone over his monthly limit. But also if Mark makes a single order over $7,000, it will also be flagged for approval. So um, I'm gonna switch back to uh, Mark's login. Um, so just to recap, we expect that um, an order to be flagged for approval if Mark spends over $7,000. Uh, that's one way for Mark to have an order held for approval. And what I've done is I've actually spent 7,000 and a bit of dollars already. So I'm gonna to go to the order history and I say you have two orders, uh, one from previous units where Mark spent $960 and that says pending. So that means that uh, because it doesn't say pending approval, that means that that order was actually uh, approved automatically and it's just waiting to go through the normal pick pack ship process. And if it had been shipped already, it would say shipped. But this order that I just placed now um, says pending approval because indeed, uh, I did spend more than $7,000. And if we look at the table at the bottom of an order details, you'll see the reasons why an order may have been um, blocked for, uh, for approval. Remember, there could be three different reasons and they're all listed if they apply. So number one, uh, order total exceeded the per order limit. That's what we expected. Um, the second one might be uh, order total uh, exceeded the per month limit, which isn't the case because we haven't spent too much money in one month yet. Um, so if I spent another um, $18,000 this month, like today, then the um, the last order or the, the order that went over that limit, that $25,000 would cause an entry here that said per, per time span limit has been exceeded. So it has to be approved for that reason. And, um, the budget that's associated with the cost center that I chose, uh, custom retail, right? That was the cost center that I used when I made this order, uh, also triggered approval. The budget associated with the chosen cost center has been exceeded. So let's find out why that is. I'm going to go back to Linda and, and look at the cost center that I chose. So cost centers, uh, custom retail. And I see that uh, it has a budget of um, 2.5 per week and 4,000 per month. So very low budgets. Uh, which is, okay, a strange setup, a strange configuration, but it does help me demonstrate these things that are going on. So now, um, because of that, um, uh, also because of that, the order has been flagged. Now, the interesting thing to note, if you, if you saw it, was that it wasn't actually Carla that's the approver now, it's Hannah. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, so if we look back at, uh, so sorry, Hannah is another approver that's higher up the, uh, the hierarchy. She's actually assigned uh, let's go, let's go back here. So this is Linda Wolf again, the, the commerce organization. If we look at, uh, the top level units, you'll see that, um, Hannah is actually a, a, an approver for the very, very top level rustic unit. So essentially Hannah is one of those people that is, is the last approver that is, uh, sought out when an order needs approval, if no other approver, um, can be found. And if Hannah even can't even approve it, then uh, the order would be turned over to the administrator for approval. So let's look up what, um, what, um, what, um, uh, what spending limits uh, Hannah has. So let's go to Hannah, Whoop, I have to go here, users. Okay, uh, Hannah, 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 Hannah. We see that Hannah has uh, the uh, 20,000 per order, budget exceeded. Remember we talked about how only certain approvers have budget exceeded. And then we had a special uh, spending limit we created just for the out of the box sample data uh, so that Hannah can pretty much uh, approve orders for a very, very long time because uh, the sample data was created a few years ago. So if we created a six month time span approval limit or, um, or budget limit, then um, it, would, it would expire when people were, were getting SAP Commerce. 
So Hannah is pretty much can can approve almost anything, but if Hannah couldn't approve something, then it would go to uh, it would go to the approver as the ultimate approver. Now, why didn't Carla uh, get the get to approve it? Let's go look at Carla's uh, settings. So Carla's purchase limit uh, is only a four thousand uh, UK order. Uh, sorry, four thousand USD order. So that means that the order that Mark placed of seven thousand uh, dollars was too high for even Carla to uh, to approve right away. And so Carla was skipped over in the in in the in the in the approval chain uh, until the the approval logic got to Hannah and said, "Okay, Hannah can make this approval." So this demo is about uh, creating uh, and assigning. Um, um, spending limits. So I'm going to go to purchase limits. You see the list of purchase limits here, active and the actual limits. Um, whether if it's a per order, it just says the amount. And if it's a per time span, uh, whoop, I want to go back. Uh, if it's a per time span, then it says amount per something, per month or per year. So I'm going to click add. Uh, I'll create a uh, test spend limit. Uh, I'm going to create a per order of um, I don't know, I guess uh, $1,000. And I'm going to assign this to custom retail. It actually doesn't matter which uh, purchase limit, uh, sorry, which unit you assign it to. Although uh, it does get tricky because if an administrator uh, can only see certain units, then you'd have to assign this purchase limit to that, uh, to units that the person has under their, uh, under their permission list. So I'm going to save that uh, there. It's as easy as that. Uh, I'm going to create another one uh, called uh, test spend limits time span and this one just it's just to show the different options so if I choose per time span I get to choose whether it's per day or week a month quarter or year so I'm going to choose per day it's in US dollars and I'm going to choose ten thousand dollars just to make it big and it's same I'm going to sign to custom retail um, as the owner of this purchase limit however to make actual use of this purchase limit I have to go to uh, what I have to go uh, sorry I clicked the wrong thing back uh, I have to go to uh, either the user or the user group so if I want to go back to uh, let's say I'll, I'll go to a new uh, a new customer this guy Axel and and I see he has whoop, uh, I see he has no purchase limits now Axel might belong to a user group let's see yeah he belongs to standard permissions but let's say I wanted to give Axel a special permission um, just for him. Then I can click manage and I can go to the purchase limit that I just created, uh, test spend limit time span and click assign. And then uh, by the way, um, there's a bit of missing information here. I mean, this is the title of my purchase limit, but I really want to know what the actual numbers are and in uh, an, an updated release of Spartacus uh, 3.2. Uh, you'll see an option to be able to see those those details. So it'll be much easier to uh, to understand uh, the details of what you're assigning uh, to someone. Um, any case, uh, and I can assign this one too, and these are not assigned. Oop, I did it too fast. Uh, so now I click done, and I see that Axel has assigned these spending limits, and whatever they happen to be, uh, they will uh, they will apply when Axel goes to make a purchase and uh, be part of that uh, incredibly complex logic chain that kicks in when Axel places an order. All right, uh, that's a quick demo of that. I'm, I'm gonna actually demonstrate um, approving uh, uh, the approval process itself in the next unit. Um, but uh, for now, uh, switching back to uh, Mark, uh, just to summarize what's happened with Mark's order, so now the settings that Mark has, whatever they are, that uh, apply to Mark for his spending limits, um, I have exceeded them. And, and uh, the reason why an order is now blocked for approval is listed down here. And Hannah actually will get, um, well, could get an email depending on how the SAP Commerce is configured, or Hannah will see this in a list uh, of approvals that she needs to do. And if Mark doesn't get an answer, he can just contact Hannah uh, but these are the reasons he finds out Mark, these, these are the reasons Mark finds out that. Uh, Mark learns that these are the reasons why his order is blocked. Uh, so uh, I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint, just close up this, this unit. Um, the, uh, just a few, uh, few little tidbits and caveats. Um, using user groups to, um, to assign purchase limits to many people is very, very useful. 
but just remember that when you're assigning uh, spending limits, uh, you can assign spend limits directly to a single person, or you can assign spend limits to a user group. And then anybody who's in that user group is, has those spend limits. But if there's a conflict between the two types of spending limits, the more permissible uh, spending limit applies. So for example, um, if you have a, um, a $2,000 spend limit assigned to a person, but then they are added to a user group that has a $10, uh, $10, a $10,000 per order spend limit. So you have two per order spend limits. The one that's more permissible is used when trying to figure out whether or not an order should be automatically approved or if it requires approval. Uh, so that's, that's an important thing to check when you don't see things working the way you want. So I'm, going to, I'm just gonna demo assigning a purchase limit to a user group. So I'm gonna switch back to um, my browser and I see that uh, I'm, well, I'm on Mark right now. So I'm gonna to go to um, Linda Wolf and the Commerce Organization. Um, I'm gonna click user group. So the purchase limit already has to exist. And I see that um, there's limited permissions, premium permissions, standard permissions. So I'm just gonna create one called test user group. Uh, and it'll belong to custom retail. And then what I can do from here is I can assign people to this user group. Um, so I can, for example, I can go ahead and assign Mark. Uh, I'm just doing this as an example, but now Mark belongs to two user groups with two different types of spending permissions. That could get pretty confusing, uh, but uh, it is that power and the flexibility that's in your hands as the buyer organization administrator. So uh, if it works for you to have multiple uh, user groups, then that's great. I mean, for example, you could create one user group for uh, per time span permissions and one user group for per order permissions. And then you just group people in whichever user group you want. Um, so I'll click done and you see that Mark Rivers is part of this, but there's actually no purchase limit yet. So I'm gonna add that by clicking manage. And I see that I have the list of all the purchase limits that I can assign, uh, just like when I'm assigning to a person. Um, so I'll assign a test spending limit and um, uh, and then this one as well, the time span one. And now I see that Mark belongs to this user group and this user group has its own purchase limits. All right, now back to the PowerPoint. Uh, a couple more things uh, to mention, uh, especially since it can be confusing about, uh, or it might be not be obvious why uh, an order is not being flagged for approval or if an order is being flagged for approval, why it's not being flagged for the reasons you thought or if it is being flagged for approval, why it's not the approver that you thought would be uh, approving it. Uh, so some things to check. Um, for example, if, if you create a user and assign a per order limit, but no per time span limit, uh, then the order is always gonna be flagged for approval because the system thinks if something is missing, then it's zero. So you can create a per order limit of $10,000, great. Somebody spends $5,000, it's within the per order limit, but if there is no per time span limit per day, per month, per year, it's it's deemed as zero. And so you automatically go over the per time span limit. So that's one thing to remember. Uh, the second thing is to look for the time span dates of budgets. Um, so a budget, uh, if I switch back to my um, browser, uh, if you recall, if I look at budgets, uh, budgets are, are given uh, not only a number, but a time span for when they're effective. Now the out of the, out of the box sample data has a huge time span, again, just because we want the sample data to work no matter if you used it six months after it was the software was released or five years after. Um, but you would normally set a time span that makes sense for your organization, like let's say for a year or for six months. So if a, um, if a person is linked to a cost center that has a budget that uh, is no longer valid because of the date, then it's like having no budget at all and it, it just uh, it's just flagged for approval or gives an error depending on the situation um, and of course what i just mentioned now is there a budget defined at all um, so um, approval uh, really what that's saying is approval is not just about spend limits but it's about whether budgets are defined properly with the cost center and if the budget dates are valid and finally um, if you're sure everything is correct and you're still not getting what you uh, what you think is is right um, you're, it's, it's good to check uh, whether the user belongs to a user group that has different spend limits than uh, the spend limits that are assigned directly to that user, which I demonstrated. Uh, so you go in those two different places and you see, and then if you've set a spend limit of $1,000 assigned to the user, 
but then they, they're part of a user group that's got a $25,000 per order limit, then the order will be permitted because the more permissible uh, limit of the same type um, applies. And finally, a word about uh, budget exceeded. Uh, it's kind of a yes, no question. Uh, when the approval workflow starts, when, when the approval uh, starts to do its uh, thing and to decide whether or not uh, an order should be uh, blocked for approval or held for approval, um, the, the order, uh, one of the things that the system checks for, the workflow checks for is, well, has the order caused a budget overrun? So let's say, you know, again, you have 10 people spend $100, the budget is $1,000 on the 11th order, then you suddenly have a budget overrun. So then it's subject to the uh, to continued examination through the approval workflow. Um, the buyer himself could have, or herself could have a budget exceeded permission. If they do, then the, the purchase is allowed. And some people may have budget exceeded permissions uh, uh, along with spending limits. Again, the flexibility of the system allows you to do that, but usually you want someone to approve that because now you're breaking the budget. Uh, but if the buyer does not have the budget exceeded, then it goes to okay, can I, uh, the approver that's assigned to this person, can they approve it? But if that approver does not have a budget exceeded permission, then they cannot approve the order either, and then it keeps going. So even though uh, an, a buyer and approver um, may have the per order and per time spend, spending limits that allow them to make a purchase without approval, if the budget has been overrun, then um, the um, they have to have this budget exceeded permission in order to either get automatic approval or to give approval. And if not, then it just goes higher up the chain until it finds someone that does have budget exceed permission or ultimately it goes to an administrator for approval. So an exceptional case. All right, that's it for this unit. So I'll see you in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome to Unit 7 of the B2B Commerce Organization course. And this one is about the checkout journey when an approval is required. So it's a short couple of slides and then we go right into the demo. So to recap the journey or the tasks or steps that the buyer has to do when checking out for B2B are slightly different from B2C. Uh, for B2B, you have your choice of paying the normal way through credit card but also uh, you can choose to pay by account, which is an arrangement with your buying company with the seller. Um, you can enter a purchase order number. Uh, you're limited in the, number, in the shipping addresses you can choose because you're paying through your company's account. And you have to choose a cost center that's linked to the unit that you belong to or the units you have access to. And that also defines uh, the budget that you're under when you make a purchase. And so um, if, um, if your purchase makes the budget go over, it requires approval. Uh, also, your administrator has assigned spending limits to you or to a user group you belong to. And um, if the purchase you're making runs afoul of those spending limits per order or per time span, let's say your, your, minute, your maximum is $500 per month or your $100 per order, then instead of your order automatically being approved, it gets uh, pushed through the approval process and an approver uh, designated to approve your orders uh, who has permissions to do so uh, is assigned the approval task. And that's what this, uh, this unit is all about. So for this example, I decide to choose somebody different that I haven't played around with uh, in this course. So the uh, buyer, G Sun, who's part of Services West uh, and is also part of a user group called Standard Permissions and uh, G's purchase limits uh, are 5,000 per order and 20,000 per month. Um, as you'll see, if you look at the sample data, G also has a, per a, an, a purchase limit assigned to him individually of 15,000 per month, but because you have two similar limits, um, the one that's bigger applies, so that's why I list here 20,000. Because G belongs to Services West, there are two approvers that could approve uh, any of G's uh, orders that require approval. The shipping address is on Canyon Lake Drive, and uh, there's a custom, uh, not a custom, there's a cost center called Services West as well, which has a, a budget called monthly 20,000, which actually goes on for years, but the limit is $20,000. All right, let's go straight to the demo. So I'm gonna switch over to my browser, um, and the first thing we're gonna do right now, this is G sends orders, but uh, I'm gonna go to the commerce organization 
And let's just quickly look at G settings to make sure that what I said was correct. So I go into the user list and find G. Um, I see that uh, G has um, no approvers. Uh, that's fine. Uh, G is part of the standard permissions user group and G has a purchase limit of 20,000 per month. So if I go to the Services West unit, I will see that um, oh, there are the approvers that G is subject to, uh, Matthew and Ming Mei. Uh, so one of these two will be given the approval task. And if I look at the cost center, I see that there's a cost center called Services West. And if I go to the cost centers to Services West, I see that there's a budget called monthly 20,000 USD. And uh, like I said, it's probably a 20 year budget, but um, it's just for demonstration purposes, but it is $20,000. If we go and look at what Ming Mei can do, uh, Ming Mei, Ming Mei. Uh, so Ming Mei is an approver. So Ming Mei uh, does not belong to a user group. Um, she doesn't have any approvers because she, her, she herself is an approver. And um, she can approve uh, 15 or 2,000 per order, which is also not the greatest sample data, uh, but what this means she can approve up to 15,000. Okay, so um, so what I've done is, um, instead of uh, making you watch me place all kinds of orders of ridiculous amounts of money, I've created a bunch of orders uh, already uh, by G. And so I see that, um, wow, there's so many orders that I have pagination here. So the first order I created has been shipped. Um, there was no, uh, there's no uh, approval table here. And it just means that um, it didn't need approval. Uh, it was passed through the approval process on its own and then somebody shipped it to me. So that's great. So I'm gonna go back to my order history so we can forget about that one. I see that out of the five orders that are in this list, um, the two oldest ones are waiting for approval. Uh, a small order I placed uh, was permitted uh, to uh, uh, went through the approval process without requiring approval, so there's nothing in the table here. There's another one pending approval and one assigned to administrator. So what's that about, right? Let's, we'll talk about it in a second. So the first, uh, the, the, the oldest order I have is over $5,000. So let's see. Um, this one requires approval because uh, the order total exceeded the per order limit. And when we go back to, um, we go back to Linda Wolf's, um, B of things, if I go to uh, G and I look at his purchase limits, I see that, um, oh, that's not correct. Uh, I see that uh, he has a purchase limit of 20 per month, uh, but he's also part of a user group. And if I go to the user group um, and see um, standard permissions, I see that the purchase limit here is uh, 15,000 per month so 15 or 20,000, so 20,000 is the max. But the most important thing here is that there's also 5,000 per order. And go back to um, sorry, go back to um, G's order details. Indeed, this order is over $5,000. And so this is correct. So we expect to see that. Um, now, uh, before I look at all the other orders, so what's happened with this order? Where is it? So this is also the point of this unit. Um, I've actually logged in using another browser as uh, Ming Mei. And uh, Ming Mei is, uh, has both role of customer or buyer and approver. So in this case, Ming Mei has access to a special menu item called approval dashboard. And when Ming Mei goes here, she sees that there are three orders uh, awaiting her approval. So let's look at the first one, the $5,000 one. So this is how approval works. Ming Mei just goes to the storefront, uh, looks for orders requiring approval, probably got an email. So Ming Mei's job is to look at the order, uh, maybe talk to the person who submitted it, but ultimately either reject the order with a comment, um, you know, uh, don't spend too much money, um, or, uh, or approve it, uh, approve order, uh, grade by, or whatever. Uh, so I'm gonna do approve for this time. Um, so, and this comment is gonna be recorded in the order. Um, so I'm gonna go back to, so I'm gonna pretend I'm, I'm G. Um, so we go to order history. I see that the order has been approved uh, and now it's gonna go through the, uh, the shipping process. And if I look at the bottom, I see that the, uh, the approval details, this is why it was blocked. And this is the comment from the approver and this is now the new status. And soon this status will change to pending or shipped or whatever the 
shipment processes. And that's really how the, or the approver gets involved. Now I'm gonna reject one, but let's look at another one. Now here's an order for $10,000. And we see that the reason is the same. The order total exceeded the per order limit. And uh, I'm G still remember, so I'm gonna, this one has no, uh, it was not blocked. This one was for $12,000. And again, the only reason that it was blocked is because of the per order limit. Uh, but finally, I placed an order for $20,000, and this has been assigned to administrator. And this one has uh, a whole bunch of reasons why um, the order has been blocked. So the, the per order limit has been breached, uh, the per time span limit per month has been breached, and um, G has exceeded the budget for the month. So if you recall, um, um, looking at, uh, we can look at my PowerPoint, we, look, we can look at um, Linda's uh, list, let's look at Linda's. Uh, if you recall that um, G has his own uh, permission, but also uh, his own purchase limit, but also, uh, sorry, one second, there we go, user groups, standard permissions. Uh, G is part of this user group. He has a limit of uh, 15, or the individual one is 20,000 plus 5K per order. And if we go back to his order, we see that he spent more than $20,000. So that's why this was triggered. That's why this was triggered. And then finally, the uh, the overall budget for the cost center G chose uh, was twenty thousand dollars, and that's why this was created. And the most interesting thing uh, to close out this demo is that um, this order has now been assigned to an administrator. Uh, let's take a look at who that is. Uh, so it's a person named Lars Bauer. So not Linda, but Lars, who's also administrator for all of Rustic. And the reason for this is. Uh, the um, the order was so big that Ming Mei wasn't able to prove it. Um, the other person who's an approver also didn't have enough permissions to prove it. And then the approval process goes all the way up the chain until um, nobody was found. And then Lars was picked as the person to do the approving. All right, so let's switch back to the PowerPoint, which uh, explains that point a little bit more. Uh, so I call it the approver ladder. Um, if you look down at the bottom right, you see that Ming Mei has uh, particular limitations when it comes to uh, approvals, and G placed a particularly large order. So up until now, Ming Mei was had enough permissions to approve, but at some point, Ming Mei did not. So um, the um, uh, the um, the order approval process starts looking for other approvers uh, going up the uh, the unit hierarchy. So um, it actually gets to the rustic uh, root level unit and Hannah Schmidt is also a candidate for approving. But even Hannah doesn't have enough permissions to approve the big order that went over budget and went over per order and went over uh, per time span. So uh, it ends up being up to an administrator to approve that order. And that's the way it works. All right, so that's the end of this uh, unit. Um, see you in the next one. Hey everybody and welcome. This is Bill Marcotte, Spartacus Product Manager, and I'm here with Unit 8 of the SAP Commerce Cloud Spartacus B2B Commerce Organization course, Disabling and Deleting Commerce Organization Entities. Uh, normally, um, it wouldn't be a big deal to talk about disabling or deleting things, but it is a big deal for B2B Commerce Organization. Most entities, and what I mean by entity, I talk about uh, you know units or users, uh, cost centers, can only be disabled. Uh, a few of them can be deleted, uh, but it's just really important to know the consequences of what happens when you disable something uh, in commerce organization. So the following uh, entities or things can be disabled only. So units, users, cost centers, budgets, and purchase limits. And it's really because uh, all these things are so interconnected and form part of a complex workflow that uh, deleting uh, one of these items when they're all connected together would cause a lot of uh, issues with the business logic. So that's why once created, you cannot get rid of anything. You can only disable. Two things that could be deleted are things that have less consequences. Um, shipping addresses and user groups. So when you, um, when you delete a shipping address, it really doesn't matter too much because when you make an order, shipping addresses uh, are recorded with the order, so it's it's copied. And user groups are just a convenience feature that collects users together, so it's not a big deal there. So 
So disabling entries is what this unit is all about. So uh, disabled entries cannot be used. You can go and look at them though. Uh, but the important thing is, is that even if you disable something, the assignments and connections between the disabled entities um, is not uh, changed. So for example, you might have a budget that is assigned to a cost center um, and it's disabled, but you can still see that the connection is there. However, when you do disable a cost center, uh, sorry, however, when you, when you do disable a budget, um, the budget is no longer applies to the, um, to the uh, let's say the overall process of approval or, um, or everything that happens when you place an order. Um, so it'll just be skipped over. And if there is no budget, then it just won't, uh, it'll just stop, uh, stop working. Um, so um, it's important to know or when you're disabling something that it has to be replaced with something else. Um, but the really, really important thing is that when you disable a unit, it disables everything that's a child or associated, mostly everything that's associated with the unit. So disabling uh, a root level unit would disable all the child units. Um, it would disable all the users that belong to those units. It would disable the cost centers and the budgets that are associated to those units. There's a good reason for this, uh, because if any of these things are partially disabled, then like I said, the business logic, it's very complex, would, uh, would sort of come to a halt uh, during the iterative process of deciding uh, what to do, what to allow, what to approve, um, what, to, what to block, etc. The other important aspect of disabling a unit that disables all the child entities underneath it, child units, users, cost centers, and budgets, is that re-enabling the unit doesn't necessarily re-enable everything below it. And that's why I caution against disabling. Make sure you know what you're doing when you're disabling something. Um, so uh, to disable something, it's pretty easy actually. You go to uh, the actual thing and you click disable and I'll demo this in a second. But like I said, unless you're fooling around with the sample system, make sure that you really want to disable it. And of course, a warning message is displayed before you can actually do the disabling. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to just demonstrate this on my server, uh, which I know I'm not going to use after I finish uh, recording all this course. So uh, just trying to get my mouse back. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to go to organization. I'm already here. I'm going to go to units, and you can see that, um, for example, uh, let's let's do rustic retail. Um, custom retail is active. There's a child unit that I created before uh, that's active. Custom retail has uh, users uh, that are active. Let's check that. Uh, let's go to the users. Um, there, Anthony, for example, is active. And of course, our favorite guy, Mark River, is active. And then the, uh, the cost center, whoop, didn't want to do that. My company. Uh, the cost center used uh, custom retail is active. So um, I'm going to go to organization and I'll do this thing. I'm going to go to custom retail and I'm going to say disable. And you get a message saying, are you sure you want to disable this, this unit? And um, I'm going to click confirm uh, the, um, uh, I, I mentioned, whoop, I just faded away. Um, I mentioned that we're doing some UI improvements for 3.2 release. And this message is much sterner. It's going to say, you know, you're going to disable a whole bunch of things. Are you really sure? So I'm going to click confirm. It says the unit was disabled successfully. Um, it might take a second for everything to happen, but for example, instantly you see custom retail is disabled here and the unit underneath it, bill unit, is also disabled. If I were to go to uh, the users list, I would start to see that some of these people are now suddenly disabled that I was talking about. Look, all these people are disabled, and uh, which means they can't log in and they, they can't make purchases, right? Um, so all these people are suddenly out in the cold. Look at the cost centers. Uh, it's taking it. Oh, there you go. Custom retail cost center disabled. The ones that I created uh, for this course are disabled. And finally, uh, budgets. You see that the budgets that were associated with custom retail cost center uh, or the ones I created are also disabled. Um, so it matches directly with that tree um, that, I, uh, that I created. And, uh, and that's it for this unit. Um, just be careful when disabling units. Um, if you disable users or anything else, 
um, the consequences are less dire, but still that person won't be able to, uh, to do anything. Uh, same thing if you disable an individual cost under a budget, um, those, uh, can, those things won't apply to the things they're connected to. All right, that's it for this unit. See you in the next one. Hey everybody and welcome to this last unit on B2B commerce organization as implemented in Spartacus. I'm Bill Mercott, the product manager for the Spartacus open source storefront. Uh, in this unit, I'm gonna give a quick summary of the uh, different aspects of B2B commerce organization that I covered in this course. But also I'm gonna use the second half of this unit to demonstrate um, how to create a commerce organization from scratch. So uh, in this course, we talked about B2B Commerce Organization, which is a feature of SAP Commerce Cloud. It's offered uh, through Headless. So the APIs allow you to uh, create and manage your commerce organization. It's originally a feature that was available with B2B Accelerator as well. Uh, in Spartacus, we've changed the interface, hopefully improved it. And uh, what it allows you to do is through Spartacus, create and manage uh, your commerce organization. And when I mean you, uh, I mean the buyer uh, administrator um, because this is a self-service um, feature. So that what happens is the seller um, gives access to a buyer administrator who then is allowed to set up uh, units, users, uh, etc. Uh, the whole organization and, and spending controls. And then it allows multiple people from the buyer organization to make purchases uh, in an organized uh, manner that allows for tracking and spending. So some of the things we talked about, uh, the entities, units, users, cost centers, budgets, purchase limits, shipping addresses, and user groups. So units, to summarize, are the building blocks and represent the hierarchy of your organization as, uh, as close or as far as you want from how it works. It's up to you. Uh, you have to create users, uh, some are administrators uh, who manage the commerce organization. Some people are buyers who act, make the actual purchases and some people are approvers uh, who come in to review an order if the order is beyond spending limits or goes over budget. Um, speaking of budgets, uh, when a buyer goes to check out, they have to select a cost center and link to that cost center is a budget. So the cost center is used for tracking and the budget is used to limit overall purchases. Uh, each user has spending limits, whether it's added through a user group or it's added directly to that user so that it can, uh, you define, or the buyer administrator defines uh, how approval requirements are triggered. And finally, uh, when you pay by account, uh, the, usually what you wanna do is have the goods sent to a particular shipping address. And so when you select a cost center, the shipping addresses that are created for the units associated uh, with that user are used. Okay. Um, Spartacus implemented B2B Commerce Organization in our 3.0 release, uh, which was released in December, and our 3.2 release coming soon, so soon being April, 2021. Uh, we're adding some UI improvements to make it easier to understand and easier to use. Uh, before I get to the demo, some further reading. The Spartacus documentation uh, contains information on B2B Commerce Organization, uh, how to use it, a tutorial that's similar to content to what you've seen in this course, how to set up uh, Spartacus with SAP Commerce Cloud, uh, how to add a new organization to back office if you want to play around, and this is what I'm going to demonstrate. And I, again, to remind you that this feature is part of the core SAP Commerce Cloud functionality. Uh, it's offered in a headless fashion, so through APIs. And so there's documentation about this feature. Um, and if you go to those help SAP links, you'll see the documentation on B2B Commerce Organization, but as well uh, on the sample store, which is important to try out the out of the box users and units and spending limits, et cetera, that are created when you use the sample store. So all that being said, I'm going to switch to this uh, demo uh, where we're going to set up an organization from scratch. First, I'm going to pretend to be the seller who's creating a user and unit for a new buyer that I have a contract with. And then I'm going to pretend to be that buyer administrator and set up some users for purchases and approvals. So here we go. Okay, so for this demo, what we're going to do is, uh, is pretend that a, a buyer has requested uh, access to the Power Tools, Power Tools uh, storefront for the purposes of creating a B2B commerce organization, setting up users, tracking um, purchases, and having uh, certain orders approved. 
Now I could log in as Linda Wolf here, but then that would give me the rest of hardware, uh, the rest of hardware um, uh, organization, which is not what I want. So here's what the seller would do. Um, they would go to back office and go to BDB commerce section, BDB unit. And from here, they would create a new unit for this uh, new company. So we'll call it uh, Nuco, Nuco. And this is a uh, new company for demonstration. And I'll just click done because that's all, uh, that's all I need. And then, uh, and then what I would do is I would create a new user or B2B customer. And here B2B customer represents uh, anybody that would be a, uh, on the buyer side. So approvers, administrators, uh, customer buyers, uh, or managers. And I'm gonna click the plus sign. Uh, I'm gonna create a new, uh, a new ID. Usually I just use the address. So it'd be bill at newco.com. Uh, customer ID will be the same. I'm gonna be called Bill Nuco. And then in the email, uh, Bill Nuco again. Uh, but I'm not done yet. I'm gonna skip over this tab and go here. Um, it's important that the new administrator, so this person that has made this request is the, you know, a buying administrator or an official from the buying company. And we have an arrangement now. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna change um, their, um, their group or their, um, their profile to be uh, a B2B admin. So here we go, B2B admin group. So that means administrator. I'm gonna get rid of the customer group so that this re refers to administrator role and the customer group refers to the buyer role or the customer role. And the default unit will be Nuco. Um, so I'm gonna click done. And finally, what I have to do is uh, go to this user. Um, whoop, I, I guess I could have done that. So Bill, search for Bill um, and give him a password. So under password, um, my standard password, don't look. Okay, and then save. So now bill at newco.com uh, should be able to log in. Uh, so bill at newco.com with my password. Let's see if this works. And it does. So now that I've set up this person using administrator role, I see that Bill has the my company and if I go to units, I would say there's only one unit. If I go to users, there's only one user, which is me. Uh, I have to be there, but there's no cost centers. Uh, there's no budgets. Uh, there's no purchase limits. So what I'm gonna do is for the purposes of demo and to keep it short, I'm just gonna create the very minimum of users, budgets, cost centers, so that someone could check out. Um, I'm gonna purposely do things wrong so that we see the error that might happen when you log in to the, to the site as a buyer and you can't check out because there's a problem with configuration. I may even do it accidentally uh, and that'll be great because then we could see the problems and fix them. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, I need, uh, let's say for example, I wanna create my, uh, my hierarchy of units. So for simplicity's sake, let's say there are just three stores in, in Nuco. Uh, there's, there's a North store and uh, we'll just keep using the default. Um, approval process and the parent unit is Nuco. Um, and then there's another one, uh, we'll call it South Store. Uh, same thing, Nuco. And then uh, we'll call it Central Store. And there we go, and Nuco. So very simple. And we'll say um, I have a buyer that belongs to Central Store. So I'm here, um, I'm gonna go to uh, Users and I can click create. So we'll call it uh, Mrs. Uh, Jane Nuco. So Jane uh, Nuco, Jane at Nuco.com. And Jane is a buyer. So in this case, a customer, and, and she belongs to the central store. So I'm gonna click save. The other thing I have to do about Jane though, is that Jane needs a password. So if I go back to, well, first let's see if Jane uh, got created. Uh, yes, she, here she is, Jane Nuco. Uh, and Jane needs a password. So I'm gonna just give her a password. Okay, all right. So now this means that Jane uh, should be able to log in. So let's, let's try it uh, without doing anything else, just to see what would, what would happen. Um, so sign in, what, Marty there. So jane at newco.com. 
and the password. And indeed I could sign in and you could see I don't have a my company entry. Um, so presumably Jane is a buyer. So I'm gonna to try to buy something right now. Um, so I'm gonna just add the sender, just it could be anything. I'm not gonna try and go over any purchase limits because there aren't any, right? Uh, pay by accounts, go to the next page, and there's nothing here. Uh, so problem number one, uh, Jane must have a cost center in order to check out. So let's go back to uh, Bill, uh, who's the uh, administrator. Whoop. Excuse me for a second, I got my wrong window. Uh, let's go to, back to Jane, uh, to Bill, who's the administrator, and create a cost center um, for Jane. So here we'll call it, uh, we'll just call it CC1, and it's in US dollars, and the parent unit will be central store, because that's where uh, Jane works from. Okay, now if I go to uh, units and central store, and then uh, cost centers, I should see a cost center, so great, right? I should be good. Um, so I'm going to go back to, so this is this is me switching back and forth between Bill the administrator and Jane the buyer. Um, so I'm going to start the checkout process once more. Uh, proceed to checkout, pay by account. I'm just going to refresh and there we have our first cost center but now there's no shipping addresses available so I still can't continue. So I'm going to switch back to, uh, to the administrator and I'm going to create um, a shipping address uh, for this unit. So central store, uh, shipping addresses, new shipping address. Uh, I'm in Canada. Uh, so let's say there's a um, uh, gym uh, delivery guy. Uh, so receiving, right? That's the kind of person. Um, one, two, three, main. Uh, five, 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 city, city, zip, it doesn't really matter. And state will be British Columbia and safe. So now when I switch back to, um, to Jane and I refresh from the checkout, you see that now I have a choice of a cost center and I have a choice of a shipping address. So just for fun, uh, I'm going to create a second shipping address um, just to uh, just to show that this is this is all working. Let's say there's another uh, another receiver. Uh, one, two, three, main, and five out of five, and city, and zip, uh, and save. And I'm also going to create another cost center um, that could be chosen. Um, so CC2, parent unit will be central store, safe. So go back to uh, Jane. Uh, start from the beginning just for fun. Account and uh, refresh. I see now Jane can choose from two cost centers and from two shipping addresses, which is awesome. Uh, and notice that the shipping addresses don't change because the two cost centers are linked to the same unit. If I wanted to, I could create child units under central store uh, with their own cost centers and their own addresses. And then the cost centers, once selected, would force a change in the shipping addresses. Uh, but let's continue there. So continue, uh, standard delivery. Now everything looks good. I'm gonna place the order uh, and I get my order. However, um, as we're gonna see um, in, the, in the order processing, there's gonna be an error happening. Uh, so the order is gonna be blocked. And the reason for this, uh, it still says created, so I have to give it a second. The reason for this, and if you've been paying attention to this course, is that we never created a budget for this um, for this cost center. And that will mean automatically that it's gone over budget, so it gets blocked, but also it actually causes an error message to be created. So while we're waiting for this to happen, um, I'll go back uh, to the cost center. I see that CC2 has no budget and uh, go back, um, CC1 uh, has no budget. Uh, so I'm gonna create a new budget, uh, add, and call it, uh, so budget one, and it's gonna start uh, March 1st, and it will end uh, way, way in the future. So end of the year, and the amount is gonna be $10,000. It's gonna belong to Central Store, save. And this budget is not assigned to any cost center. So I'm gonna go back, cost centers, uh, CC1 budgets, and now, I can assign budget one to this cost center 
and uh, I'll do the same for uh, CC2 just for simplicity's sake. Reuse the same, uh, the same budget. So now, if I were to go to budgets, I should see that this budget is assigned to two cost centers, which I do. All right, cool. So back to Jane the buyer, um, doing a refresh here, uh, and it says pending. And if I look at the bottom, um, it says um, a couple of error messages about spending limits and also um, there's no budget, so there's an error, so cannot continue. So this, this, this order has been blocked for a few reasons. Um, uh, first of all, I mentioned already the problem that if there's no budget, then it can't continue. Um, so in fact, um, the budget's not even considered zero, it's just it has to go against some budget, so that's why it says error. And this, this, budget, this order cannot continue, there's just, uh, it's just blocked. However, um, now that I have a budget and I redid the order, we would still get blocked because we didn't create any spending limits. I remember I said in one of the units that um, if there's no spending limit of a certain type, then it's considered zero. So this purchase goes over the per time spend spending limit because it is zero per day, month, year, whatever. And it's also over the zero of uh, per order. So if there hadn't been this budget error, then an approver could potentially approve this order. Um, but, um, but there's no, um, um, there's no, um, uh, there's no approvers. Um, so it's just, it's, it's still, a, it's still a bit configuration, uh, challenged. So let's go back and let's give, um, let's give Jane, um, some spending limits. Uh, let's see, Jane, Jane, Jane. Oh yeah. Users, Jane. Uh, so Jane has the role of buyer, uh, and we'll put the purchase limits directly. Um, oh, no, I have to create them first, excuse me. Uh, so purchase limits. So I'm gonna create uh, one purchase limit uh, per order, uh, five, uh, 1,000, let's say. Uh, and it's per order, 1,000. Parent unit will be uh, central store, save. And then another purchase limit will be uh, per month, uh, 10,000. And then it'll be one of these per time span. I'll choose the period of month and then hit enter the 10,000 threshold. It's US dollars and again, central store. All right, so now we have two purchase limits. And when we look at them, um, we see that, uh, oh, you can't see from here. Okay, one sec. Um, we go back to Jane uh, and we see Jane still doesn't have any purchase limits, but now that I've created some, I can click on manage and I can assign both of these purchase limits to Jane. And now when Jane checks out, um, everything should be fine because we have a budget um, and we have two purchase limits. If I hadn't, haven't made any mistakes, then everything should work. So uh, let's do another order that's below the purchase limits. Proceed the checkout, continue. Whoop, I didn't do that right. Account, continue. Doesn't matter which cost center and which uh, shipping address, but let's choose one, continue, continue, and then uh, place order. Okay, so now um, while we wait for this order to be created and go through the process, let's create an order that's, um, that's you know, $5,000 uh, or so. So I'm just gonna look for a few very expensive uh, items and then uh, I'm just gonna raise the quantities so that they, uh, they come to many, many uh, dollars. Uh, so let's see, there we go, not enough yet. Okay, so we're up to $6,000. If you recall, um, Jane's spending limits are per month of $10,000 and per order of 1,000. So a $7,000 order will be okay for the month, but not okay for the per order. Uh, whoop, that's back up, so we don't need that. Uh, so here we go. Uh, proceed the checkout, pay by account, uh, should be, uh, should require approval, uh, continue, ship this address, continue, continue, and place order. Okay, so now we've placed two orders, one very small, one very large. Um, the one that I, I, that's very small is in a pending state. Now you remember uh, with the out-of-the-box setup for SAP Commerce Cloud, we're using the order management, the built-in order management tools. And so the way the out of the box works is that uh, an order that is approved or goes through the approval workflow, in this case, this one, uh, requires a pick pack ship um, and someone in, who's a shipper to say, yeah, I shipped that thing. 
So uh, seeing the word pending here and in process means that the order is not held, it's not required for appro requiring approval, and there's no message anyway to say that. So this order has been approved automatically and it just takes somebody from the warehouse to ship it. So this order came within the, um, the, the budget, it came within the spending limits, and, uh, and it's good to go, there's no errors. So, uh, so we fixed all our configuration issue now. Uh, if I go back to order history and go to the uh, new order, we see that it says assigned to administrator. Uh, now we said that an order that was above $5,000 should require an approver. Why is it assigned to administrator? Because we never created any approvers. However, uh, if there are no approvers found, then the administrator is asked to approve something, which is Bill, the Nuco guy. Remember, uh, uh, if we go to uh, users, Bill Nuco is the admin. So um, if I were to look at uh, back at Jane's order, it says it's assigned to Bill Nuco because the order exceeded the per order limit and not the other limits. It didn't exceed budget. It didn't exceed the per month. Um, so if I go back to uh, Bill, um, who now has a approval dashboard. So as an approver, as an, as an administrator, usually Bill doesn't approve things, but because the order is way beyond all the configured limits, then it comes to, uh, it comes to Bill. So Bill goes here, uh, he looks at the order and says, yeah, we need all these things. Um, doesn't have to write a comment, but I'm gonna put okay anyway, approve. So uh, Bill has done his job and uh, back to Jane uh, and it should take a few seconds. But if I look at the order history now, you see that the order has been approved um, and so now it'll go through the normal process where uh, somebody in the warehouse will have to uh, package it and ship it. Finally, um, if I wanted to, um, and I'll go back to some back at, at Bill, uh, if I, I realize, you know, I don't wanna keep being the person who does all these order approvals, I'll go back to my company. I'll create a user called um, uh, Miss uh, Miss Annie uh, Approver, uh, Annie at newco.com, who's an approver, uh, and she belongs to Central Store. And I'm adding her as an approver to this unit. Remember that uh, a person can be an approver role, but they don't actually get to approve anything unless they're actually assigned to be the approver. So uh, we see that uh, going back to Annie, she has the role of approver, but the most important thing, if you want her to appro approve something for somebody buying stuff through a unit, uh, so central store, they have to be on this list for Annie to get the approval. Um, so I'm not gonna demonstrate that. So what I could do is I can make another order that uh, breaks the budget or, um, uh, or, or goes over spending limits. Um, and then Annie would, would be the first person to choose to approve it. But also remember, Annie needs her own spending limits. So um, if I go, uh, if I make a purchase as, um, uh, as Jane and I go over spending limits and it needs approval, Annie still won't be able to approve it. Why is that? Uh, because Annie uh, doesn't have spending limits, uh, purchase limits assigned to her. So Ann, Annie would need her own spending limits and then Jane makes the purchase. And if it's within the spending limits, uh, Annie would be the approver. And if it's, uh, sorry, if it's with, within Annie's approver limits, Annie would be the approver. If the order is way too much, then it'll still go to Bill, the administrator. And that's everything I wanted to show in this uh, course ending demo. I hope you found it useful. Uh, always willing to hear feedback. Hit me up on our Slack, Spartacus Slack. If you have questions, uh, all the information I've talked about is in our Spartacus documentation. And uh, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.